My name is Jacob Tobiah. I'm a sophomore this year. I've been involved with Occupy Duke for about the past four weeks, really ever since it got started. We're really starting to latch on to this idea of endowment transparency as a very important thing. Duke has a $5.7 billion endowment and we don't know anything about where it's going. It's just being, tra it's, it's in thousands of transactions per day, but there's no record for the public of those. Uh, we're talking right now actually at our General Assembly about the Coalition for Conflict-Free uh, conflict Duke that's looking to address conflict minerals in electronics and what Duke as a shareholder in a lot of different electronics corporations can do uh, to, to combat conflict minerals in electronics. Another thing that we're looking at right now is looking at how Duke can make more ethically minded students who can critically analyze systems of privilege because the reality is that many Duke students will go on to run the corporations that are currently causing a lot of the problems in our society. And if we have ethically minded people who understand systems of privilege running those organizations and running those corporations, we can change the system from the inside. All right, hello everybody. Um, my name is Jacob Tobaya. I am a sophomore this year pursuing a program two major in human rights advocacy and leadership. And the video you just saw was from uh, November, which was about a month after Occupy Duke had been started. For me, Occupy Duke was something that was challenging, it was exciting, it was riveting. Uh, but most importantly, it's something that I learned a lot from. And so today, now that the tents have come down off of the chapel quad and Occupy Duke has come to a close, I want to talk to you about the three things I learned from Occupy Duke. So when we first set up the tents on the main chapel quad, people were a little shocked. They were like, who are these people? What gall they have to set up these tents obstructing the view to the beautiful chapel? Clearly, this is unprecedented. No one has ever done this before, right? Well, let me, let me explain. It was like a spaceship had landed on campus. I forgot that part, <laughs> which explains the TIE fighter. Um, at any rate, it was like a spaceship had landed on campus. People were like, we've never seen anything like this before, right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> uh, in reality, Occupy Duke was walking in the footsteps of a long tradition of social activism and protest on campus. Uh, I think part of me wonders whether or not these students who were shocked by Occupy Duke remember 1968 where a thousand students, faculty, staff, and employees uh, occupied the chapel quad for a silent vigil in protest after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, protesting the current employment conditions at Duke and the racism that still pervaded the institution. I also wonder if a lot of these students who were shocked knew about 1986, when a bunch of Duke students set up a shantytown on the main quad, protesting the fact that Duke, as an as a institution with our endowment, was still investing in apartheid South Africa. And after they protested, Duke agreed to divest from South Africa, joining an international movement that pressured the end of apartheid. And I also wonder if those students knew about 1998, when a group called Students Against Sweatshops occupied president, or the president's office, protesting the fact that in the Duke University stores, a lot of the merchandise we were selling was coming from sweatshop labor. And within a year, Duke and the Board of Trustees passed a resolution saying that any Duke merchandise was not going to be made in sweatshop labor, and that is still true today. So that brings me around to the first thing that I learned from Occupied Duke. The first thing that I learned from Occupy Duke is that Duke students, by and large, do not understand Duke's history. And consequently, they do not realize that Duke is at its core an activist campus. So at the Occupy site, um, you know, we would sit around in our little lawn chairs uh, in front of the tents and encourage people to come and talk to us about what we were doing and why we were sitting out there. So one night, I'm sitting out there reading a book, finishing up my homework at 1 a.m. Uh, when a student comes up to me and says, hey, what's this whole Occupy Duke thing about? And I go, oh, because I want to go to sleep. Um, but you know, I, I'm like, OK, well, let's talk. And I start giving him the basic uh, spiel that we've been giving. I tell him that Occupy Duke is very concerned with the increasing income disparity in this country that's developed over the past three decades. And for the most part, when I said that, he was with me. He was like, OK, I, I get that. The second thing I started talking about was how we were concerned with the fact that the rich were getting richer in this country and that CEOs are making multi-million dollar bonuses while they drive their companies into the ground, make risky investments, and fail to provide basic health insurance and a living wage for low-level employees. And that's where I kind of lost him. He said to me, but don't CEOs deserve the money they make? To which I replied, maybe. Because uh, the, the, and we went on to keep talking and, and we talked about the role, like the poor in this country and what's going on right now. We talked about our obligation as a society to the poor and we talked about the moral obligation that CEOs have to the people they employ and how, much that, how far that goes. And we finally got around to the fundamental question that was separating us. And the fundamental question that was separating us was, do you deserve what you have? 
for the student I was talking to, the answer was simple. Um, he had worked hard in high school, he had gotten good grades, was admitted to Duke, and thus was entitled to all of the privileges and wonderful things that this university has to offer. What I tried to tell him was that uh, it's a little more complicated than that. That actually, underneath that whole cycle is his own privilege, which made it easier for him to come here. That we, that me, that him, that all of us, have some degree of privilege that gives us the opportunity to get to a wonderful institution like that. And that's something we have to recognize. You see, none of us get anywhere by hard work alone. We always get what we accomplish. Any success we have comes from a combination of hard work, our own individual privilege and circumstances, and sometimes pure chance. Which brings me to the second thing that I learned from Occupy Duke. The second thing I learned from Occupy Duke is that Duke as an institution and a whole lot of Duke students don't understand this diagram. That we focus as an institution so hard on the fact that hard work brings success and thus you must work hard, ignoring the privilege that we all have and ignoring the fact that sometimes chance is extremely operative in where, why you're successful. And my bigger question today to you is, what do we lose as an institution when we look at the world this way? And I would say that we lose a lot. The first thing we lose is that we lose the ability to look at the lives of others compassionately. We, lo we lose the ability to understand that even though someone may have worked hard, they may not have had the same degree of success that we do. Secondly, we lose the ability to look at our own lives with compassion and to understand that when we inevitably at times fail, that sometimes that's not always because we didn't work hard enough. Sometimes that's because we were not in the privileged position we needed to get something done or because chance just didn't work out for us. And the last thing is that we lose our way as an institution uh, when this happens. So uh, when Occupy Duke was going on, about a month in, around that time that video was made, a meme was released on the internet with a picture of Occupy Duke, a rather poor picture, um, that uh, had it underneath a caption saying, the 1% <laughs> decides to occupy itself. And it was meant satirically, but after I thought about it for a while, I was like, yeah. That's exactly what we're doing. That is the whole point. Um, the point of Occupy Duke was to try and transform the 1% from the inside. Which brings me to the third and final thing I learned about, from Occupy Duke. I learned that through changing the way we talk about success, about hard work, about privilege, and about chance, Duke has a remarkable ability to change the world and an amazing potential to do so. The reality is that Duke students will go on to lead Fortune 500 companies, to sit at the heads of government, to be in charge of really important foundations. We, in a lot of senses, will become the 1%. But if we can educate students who are, or are ethically minded, who are critically aware of systems of privilege, and who understand the limitations of their own knowledge, we can change fundamentally the way that the 1% relates to the 99%. Through educating our students differently, those students will go on to change the world. So how do we do it? I'm not gonna claim that I know all the answers, but what I will say is I know it won't just take the 1%, it won't just take the 99%, it will take 100% of the Duke community. Thank you. <laughs>